All right, so I want to welcome everybody to the uh, Technology Ideation Forum, uh, Innovation Ecosystem Platform and Forum. The goal here is to present new, novel, innovative ideas uh, to make people aware of, of what is out there and what is available. And and also we want uh, want people in the audience to to truly understand what it is that our presenters are trying to accomplish, uh, what their product does, try and and see if it's applicable to you because you know where the, where they may be working in in the uh, where they may be working in the robotics industry or focused on manufacturing. You yourself may be focused on the medical industry or. Um, or you know biotechnology and and see applications that they don't see because they don't work in your field and and that's the goal here that's why we we reach out to such a broad audience of of scientists engineers hobbyists inventors uh, program managers because everybody has ideas and it, and if we if we don't share those ideas and we don't expose ourselves to these new Technologies, new capabilities, were, were kind of kind of lost, and that's what I want to do. I want to find people that that can help generate these aha moments where we're having these interactions, and one person asks a question of a presenter, or the presenter says something, and and you're like, wait a minute, you know, what if, or could you, or would you, or how about? So that's what this is all about. So please feel free to raise your hand or interrupt. Uh, I prefer unless that if you have a microphone that you either raise your hand or or interrupt and to ask your question. If you don't, feel free to put it into the chat and and I will pause the speaker. Same thing. You can raise your hand. I'll pause the speaker and uh, and ask your question. But but I will always give you the opportunity to ask it because it's really in that verbal interaction that these aha moments come. Uh, our, our mind processes information much differently when we're doing it verbally rather than than reading. So with all of that, let a few more people in here before we get started. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Alistar and, and Hypersub. Uh, this was a presentation that was done on the federal version of this forum, and it generated a lot of interest. Uh, it's a fascinating vehicle, and I believe that uh, that people will be able to see that, and hopefully we'll be able to find some applications. So, Alistar, I'll turn it uh, over to you. Thank you, Eugene, and uh, thank you to everyone that's uh, calling in to look at this. Um, so, what let, let's set the scene. What you're looking at is uh, uh, the fast boat submarine uh, from Hypersub Platform Technologies based in Lake City, Lake City in north central Florida. Um, the image that you're looking at is the R&D vessel that we have and operate. Uh, we are considering ourselves as TRL6, Technology Readiness Level 6. So we're kind of pre-sales. Um, We've got an ECC number for commercial export, so it's a dual use, and of course it's a dual modality. It's a, it's a surface vessel and submarine uh, built into one. Also worth noting that it's uh, uh, it's been designed and will be delivered uh, class society fully compliant, either DNVGL, ABS, or or whatever. And in fact, our engineering team. Uh, has someone who used to work for DNVJL and was involved in uh, certifying the sealed delivery vehicle, uh, the dry sealed uh, delivery vehicle um, a few years ago. So, so what we, yeah, we're looking at uh, our R&D vessel, which has done in excess of uh, almost 40 now uh, successful dives um, in lakes, in freshwater in Florida. But as my boss in the Intel department but, used to say, real quick, Alistair, before you get started, is is this something that people can come and see? We we you know if there's if you know it's not generally on display that you can just drive past and go and have a look. But we certainly if somebody's got a clear interest, we could uh, set up a uh, could set up a visit to to come and view it. Yes. Okay. Thanks. 
So, yes, yeah, as, as, as my old boss in the Intel department used to say, uh, very interesting, but so what? You know, uh, you need to have a, <clears throat> a so what? And this is kind of uh, the reasoning behind it, the current defense requirements that we think we're, we're addressing. Um, uh, General Berger uh, talked a lot, um, you know, about moving away for the Marine Corps to move away from ground-based vehicles uh, to a balance of manned and unmanned semi semi-autonomous fleets. And uh, Del Toro also, um, you know, talking about um, uh, craft, small craft for uh, sensing and reconnaissance, uh, etc. Um, mobility inside the WEZ, a focus on CT net, net, C2 networks in, or C3 networks, even in the lit, littoral environment. And again, uh, Neller and, and, and Richardson talked about hard to find, hard to hit platforms with an ability to conduct sea-based inshore maritime raids, amphibious advanced force operations. So that's where we're playing in with, with this system, a literal craft that is multi-use, uh, has multi-capabilities as, as we'll uh, see. So here's the elevator pitch. It's a long range speedboat. And by long range, we're talking at the moment in this format, roughly 400 nautical miles. This could be extended with uh, additional tanks, etc. <clears throat> it's got on board uh, heavy lift capability because it's got uh, large ballast tanks on board. It's got an ultra shallow draft, so it can operate in very shallow waters, but it can use that heavy lift ballast uh, to uh, dive and become a, a battery propelled uh, uh, submarine. Um, the transition uh, between speedboat and submarine um, could be less than less than 60 seconds if required. And when it goes subsea, it is it's propelled uh, by uh, subsea thrusters, hydraulic over electric thrusters. Um, and um, on the surface, obviously, it's got uh, twin diesel at the moment, twin diesel engines uh, for surface propulsion. It's got a pressure boundary dry cabin or dry module, depending if you want to put humans in there or not. And so that makes it unique in that it's not a wet sub, it's, it's a dry compartment submarine. So everything's at one atmosphere in there. And so you can spend many, many hours uh, submerged. And it's also uh, scalable and modular. And so uh, payload agnostic, we can stick whatever payloads uh, on there in whatever kind of format. And the whole idea is you can have multiple modules for a single vessel hull that can be changed out and be uh, uh, mission specific. So this is looking at the configuration and really this uh, this chart here, which is not the greatest of charts, but it's showing the mix of surface fuel capability and subsea fuel capability being battery packs. And the idea is that uh, you can modify uh, dependent on your mission. Do you want to do a lot of surface uh, work with very little subsea, in which case you add additional uh, fuel payloads for the surface? Or do you just have a short range uh, distance to go and then you want to spend a long time subsea, in which case you can put much more uh, uh, subsea battery power. Again, we talked about the modules and several modules uh, we've already got designed, including a lock-in, lock-out chamber uh, to allow for uh, a diver delivery. And again, these modules can be crewed or uncrewed depending on what uh, what the requirement is. The, these modules are about uh, uh, 48 inches across, but but they can be extended in size uh, as required, as can the vessel. As I say, it's scalable. It's uh, currently in the kind of 45 to 47 foot uh, range, but we've already got a design for something that's around about 100 foot as well. So that's really just an update of what I just said. You know, we've got a, a dry module cabin advantage. So that's a high degree of flexibility of uh, various payloads. Uh, the dry cabin means if you've got a new payload that you want to put in there, it doesn't have to be marinized or um, contained for uh, within a pressure vessel. You can put it into the uh, the pressure, you know, pressure proof chamber itself and keep it at one atmosphere. So we're very quick to be able to put in uh, lots of different payloads, <clears throat> as well as having multiple uh, penetrator penetrators into the cabin. So that allows for uh, multiple different uh, equipments to be to be in there. The hyper buoyancy means it's highly tolerant to payload changes and and, and payload locations and um, 
the surface twin diesel engines and the batteries obviously making it uh, a, a dual capability, dual modality craft. 500 gallon fuel load, which gives you that 400 uh, nautical mile range. And it's got on onboard recharge capabilities. So it's got both uh, air compressors uh, for filling the, the air cylinders that operate the ballast tanks. And it's got two inverters on board to be able to recharge uh, the batteries multiple times uh, during during a mission. That could be done uh, semi-covertly -covert by, uh, uh, by the use of uh, snorkels because you need to run the engines to run the inverters. So we can put snorkels on board and just sit below the surface get the air in needed to run the diesel engines, etc. Alistair, before you go on, the um, are you customizable? So if if someone had a an electric motor that they wanted to put in versus a diesel or you know a different type of diesel motor or gas engine because they want to use this for special operations, uh, changing the hull you change the material of the hull. Are, are all those possibilities? Yes, those are all possibilities and things we've uh, looked at, uh, particularly, um, uh, you know, getting away from uh, marine grade aluminum and, and uh, uh, looking at carbon fiber and lots of other things. So, so yes, um, as long as as long as it can be done within uh, class approval, we will we will do it. And 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 that raises a good point as well about uh, you know, talking about carbon fiber and 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 the tragedy that happened uh, um, at, at the end of last year was um, or towards the end of last year. Um, it's it's worth reiterating. In the last fifty years, not one person has died within a, a subsea vessel that's class approved. Um, and so um, that that's certainly high on our, uh, our on our list of things. If it can't be class approved, then it it won't be uh, installed. But certainly, uh, alternative. Uh, I think it's later in the presentation. You know, we we're definitely looking at uh, alternative means of uh, propulsion, etc., where it may be applic applicable. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, um, what does all that mean? A large volume fixed displacement allowing for a high degree of flexibility, as we talked about. So that means multiple different types of uh, uh, packages, heavier than water, lighter than water packages, uh, pressure sensitive payloads can all be uh, incorporated into it very easily. Uh, we've got a central chassis allow there that allows for easy modifications. We're able to hang stuff off it. Uh, the, the chassis has been designed uh, to give it a very low profile um, and, and which gives it added stability, which again uh, allows for multiple different payload changes and positioning. And we got lots of hard point uh, bracket capability, so that you can, uh, at the last minute, uh, you know, fix on additional payloads as as the mission may require. <clears throat> and in its uh, forty five to forty seven foot form. Um, Outside of the the fuel and the batteries and all the rest, you can put an additional three to six thousand uh, pounds of payload on there. Um, so it's uh, extremely uh, extremely uh, malleable in 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 what you can do with it. So are you going to get into um, contested logistics at all and towing capacity for this? Uh, not not specifically, but it, contested logistics is something that we have been just as we talk just now are being talk, uh, being asked about, uh, and so um, so yeah, towing towing capacity is a, is a is a is a good point, uh, and I'm not sure what that is. We've got you know we've got twin four eighty horsepower uh, uh, surface engines, but once you go sub C, the more you go want to pull, uh, then the quicker you're going to be using up those. Uh, uh, those battery packs. Uh, so that that would be a calculation that we would have to make depending on what it was we were required to tow. And what type of battery packs are you using? What's the the charge time? Uh, so th so the battery packs again. What what does the client want? So we, we you know we you know at the moment we've got truck batteries in the uh, glass mats. Um, the advantage of those is they're very quick to re uh, uh, charge and they're very robust. Um, we we see some clients will want to mix a glass mat and a glit a mix of uh, you know more complex uh, battery types, but the battery situation is moving so fast at the moment we're just kind of uh, uh, willing to put whatever is you know required in there within the payload that that works for the client and see what's best. 
the battery packs are, are starting to get uh, smaller in size for the amount of uh, um, you know kilowatt hours that you get out of them. So uh, so yeah, that's that's a kind of uh, talk talk to the to the the immediate client about what's available at the moment. Uh, again, um, on a case by case basis. All right, and one last thing: Are you going to cover um, power capabilities? So, if somebody wanted to put external equipment on here, radios, electronic warfare, whatever, do you do you have those? You know, forty-eight volts, one ten. Yeah, we, yeah, we, forty-eight, one ten. You know, um, whatever's required, we you know we can put in step step down, step up transformers as required. Um, so yeah, um, that 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 can that's all covered. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll let you continue. Sorry, but no, that's okay. It's good. It's all good questions. <clears throat> so yeah, the mo mobility and persistence. Of course, being a surface vessel, it's incre incredibly mobile, incredibly fast. You know, it's in excess of uh, thirty knots. Uh, the the vessel that we've got at the moment, with the engines we've got at the moment. But as I say, being modular, we can we can put something else in if a client wants. And um, with a with a extremely shallow draft, less than three feet. It's uh, very easy to launch or to, uh, you know, have on standby within a shallow area, even a, a river estuary or, a you know, a, a standard yachting marina or whatever it, it, it can be launched from. Um, and that provides so that provides us range and mission persistence with with the 500 gallon plus on board. And then uh, with the onboard recharging capabilities, as we've said, eight times the eight times the battery load. Um, you know, up to 1,500 kilowatt hours using the standard fuel load. Uh, and then we can recharge those using the inverters on board multiple times uh, as might be required. And of course, it all depends how quickly you're going to need to recharge those because the faster you want to go uh, uh, sub C or, or as you suggested, Eugene, the, whatever you want to tow, then that's going to use these uh, batteries up uh, much quicker. But but just, I think it, it's covered later, but but our maximum uh, targeted uh, subsea speed around six to seven knots. But we don't see people uh, uh, doing that consistently uh, just, just when required. I think I've already covered this. Uh, multiple through hull connectors uh, allowing for uh, you know multiple systems and multiple upgrades. Um, one of the other kind of cool things about the concept is even if even if somebody wants it as an uncrewed system, we can fit it with a crewed. Uh, cabin capability, small crude cabin capability, so you can put a human being in the loop while you're doing the the uncrewed uh, testing or or the full autonomy uh, capability testing. You can still put somebody, you know, supervising the autonomy uh, at all times until you're 100 percent sure about uh, about what's going on. So that's another key key thing. Even if you wanted a fully autonomous variant, you could stick uh, uh, an engineer in there to uh, um, to to work with it as as you're developing the capability. Um, special performance, as it says, you know, we can be sitting on the bottom of a you know of the, of the sea or a river estuary, in in as little as seven feet of water with with nothing showing above, um, in you know above the water line, <clears throat> we can actually travel horizontally in in less than fourteen feet of water, and uh, we can be. Uh, launched and 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 recover in in two and a half feet of water, so <clears throat> you can drop people off uh, pretty much dry uh, if if required, and pick people up or pick up uh, as, as as required. <laughs> lots of lots of ideas about but what we might want to use this for. Uh, obviously, a subsea weapons platform. We've already got uh, a potential client that we're working with, who's talking about putting uh, uh, mini torpedoes on there so that you can. Uh, Use it as a uh, as a torpedo boat on the surface, or even uh, launch torpedoes once once you're sub subsea uh, subsea supply platforms. And again, we've been talking to Marine Corps and other and other people. Uh, MSU Miltech have been working with us uh, on uh, <clears throat> on talking about contested logistics capability, a wider, flatter variant of the system that could just uh, resupply the beach. And also a lot of interest at the moment in a mothership for uh, USVs, uh, you know, or uh, UAVs, that should say, not UUVs, UAVs. Um, one, one of the main problems finding in the Baltic Sea at the moment, in, in the Black Sea, sorry, 
is uh, you know launching a lot of uh, unmanned small reconnaissance craft in there, but um, they can do us so much of a mission a couple of hours and then they re need recharging. So by launching them from a, a mothership like this, <clears throat> they could come back to the mothership, uh, be recharged, have their da data downloaded and sent back out on a on a, an additional mission. Uh, same with uh, you know aerial drones as well. And obviously, it, 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 it's it's ripe for using uh, C4 ISR type integration, EW and the like, um, and being able to pop up, do what it needs to do, and then drop back down, sit on the seabed for, for hours or days on end, and then be used uh, when required. And as we spoke about before, or I mentioned before, uh, if you ever got a, a, a swim swimmer delivery uh, lock-in lock-out chamber, then uh, you can do those kind of operations as well. All right, so we have a, a question in the uh, in the chat. Yeah. Brian, Brian Crawley, if you would please ask your question. You can unmute yourself, unless of course you don't have a microphone. All right, so Brian asks, um, can it be beached on the sea floor or landed on the beach if the craft is capable of sand, coral, rock, polar ice, concrete boat ramps, steel deck, or marine ships. Is the vessel reusable after such events over and over again? Is there an HDPE or nylon skid plate on the underside of the boat? So, so all good questions, and a lot of those we don't have answers to because it's TRL6 and uh, we haven't done all the full testing. At the moment, it's, it's built of uh, marine-grade aluminum, and so it, it's got, uh, you know, a certain a certain fragility built in built in with that, um, but yes, it 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 you know depending on what the the, the client specific uh, missions would be, then we would build the system uh, around that. Uh, and uh, yeah, but that's a bit of a fudge answer. But uh, uh, we, there's still a lot of work to do on the uh, real life world, especially under ice type type things. Um, this system is um, we've only got the one uh, vessel. At the moment, and so all that needs to be uh, discussed and talked about and uh, and tested. But certainly, um, we see that it'll easily be uh, uh, taken up to a, a you know a, a river a river bank edge or a, into into a sandy area and um, launched. We we've done it. There's a photograph of it doing it uh, here in the lakes in Florida in in less than two feet of water, and we push it on and then bring it back out into the into the open water. So, so yeah, a lot, a, a lot of work to be done on on materials analysis, uh, as well as um, acoustic analysis and and the like. Um, so I'm sure we'll keep uh, once we're up and running with our first sales, we'll be keeping the likes of Cardrock and these people very busy um, with with uh, testing on, on behalf of the clients. So good, good, good questions. Brian, was that sufficient? You got your answers. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the FBS 45 uh, or 47, whatever, whatever we want to call it, I'll have to get, get make sure these things are consistent in, in my briefing. But anyway, um, in, in its current form, it's there. It's about it's about 13 tons. It's around 45 to 47 feet uh, with a 16 and a half foot beam. So it's quite quite wide across the way, as you can see. And, and that's all part of the giving it a, a high stability and low uh, low profile. Uh, which, which all helps with that. Doesn't help with transporting it in uh, small aircraft, <laughs> but uh, you know, um, th this is the best uh, form for the for the actual uh, missions that it's required. As you can see, the draft depending on the V, and you were talking about different uh, hulls. You know, there's a V to W hull blend, and there's a V hull blend. Um, the V hull would be used more if there was going to be a dive or delivery in the V to W. Uh, more for the ISR, but uh, uh, there's the dry module uh, carbon as is on the system just now. But again, that can be uh, changed in in size, uh, both length and width. <clears throat> Five hundred plus gallons of uh, of fuel, and that's the engines we have on board at the moment. Other engines are available, and then the prime primary battery system, twelve volts, dive batteries, ninety six volts DC, and then as you asked about, we would have breakouts there um, for all the penetrators to be able to supply, you know, whatever voltages uh, were required. 
And then there's a fair bit of deck space on the system as is uh, at the rear and down the sides, which can then be used for uh, uh, putting, you know, remotely operated vehicles or uh, diver delivery scooters or any any other kind of equipment or cargo in open boxes if it's if it's waterproof and pressure proof or uh, you know in in uh, in a pressure container if if required for for dryness etc <clears throat> we also have a full and i don't want to talk to about it too much because it's kind of our secret sauce but we've got an air compensation system uh, in the uh, vessel so instead of using oil to fill any air filled uh, areas that that would be prone to to pressure or water leak we um we've got a um an air compensation system that uh, slightly over pressures whatever uh, air space is there to to avoid ingress of, of water or the, or, the, or the effect uh, effects of pressure sorry these are just some of the things that people tend to ask us about. Um, you know, we've got a, a lot of emergency capability in this system. We can uh, recover it to the surface, even if it, if it was a, a crude version and the and it and the cabin got flooded. You could still recover it to the surface. We can put a a, a ballast uh, tray on the vessel if if a client requires it. So that ballast tray it carries a ballast with it and should. Um, uh, should it die, then you drop the ballast tray and, and that then becomes uh, buoyant and returns to the surface. But you can actually operate the um, uh, operate the the tanks um, w on a dead sub. So if you've got no power whatsoever, you can mechanically uh, operate the ballast tanks and uh, get air into them and, and recover to the surface. So we've got multiple uh, uh, you know, safety systems built in. Uh, we've also got standard uh, oxygen and and uh, carbon dioxide, uh, you know, monitoring systems on there, a, and additional, you know, additional uh, emergency air for for all on board. Um, talking about on board, the, the, as as a forty, it probably be if if it had a lock in lock out chamber, it'd probably be near a, a fifty feet long, um, but it would take six uh, swimmers with minimum gear in there and then uh, a crew of one or two uh, piloting and, and navigating the system or operating weapons or, or whatever. Uh, so probably around eight people in all. And it, it has emergency uh, air for eight people for 48 hours, uh, but that can be extended as required. And as you see, we've got full SCBA umbilical and scuba support system on there for for recharging or refilling uh, uh, cylinders. And then uh, again, it, we're agnostic to whatever, but at the moment we're looking to uh, deliver it with a, um, a semi-autonomy package, uh, what I would call a supervised autonomy package. So you would have uh, something like uh, Seabite or Green Sea um, navigation software, you know, um, navigate by, by cursor on, on, on your chart. Uh, hold station using a DVL INS system, etc. So um, uh, th there's a good little package from Sonodyne that can go on there <clears throat> and provide all the INS and uh, gyro compassing and uh, DVL for for uh, for station keeping <clears throat> in any amount of uh, you know target uh, or uh, obstacle avoidance sonars or even a sonar for when you're in surface mode. Uh, for uh, making sure you don't run aground on on any reefs, etc. So all sorts of stuff that we can put on there for uh, for safety. There's a surface performance. I think already mentioned it, but uh, you know, <clears throat> up to about uh, thirty plus knots at, at wide open throttle, uh, but a four hundred nautical mile range if you if you trim it back to about uh, twenty six knots. Uh, optional payload. Uh, says 3,000, but we could fit up to 6,000 if required. Operate the sea state six, and uh, of course we've got a low center of gravity. Um, and the other thing being, it's a submarine, so if it's getting a bit uh, rough up top, you can always you can always dive. Beachable with its ultra shallow draft, notwithstanding the question about uh, it getting torn on the on, on the reefs, etc., which we certainly need to make sure we're capable of if if there's going to be reefs in the area. And it can survive a surface hull breach. So the hull is not 
contingent on keeping the thing afloat, as is with a normal surface vessel with uh, with the you know the buoyancy within the ballast tanks, etc. As well, that get, that keeps it afloat as well, so it can survive hull breach. So MERS performance nominally five and a half knots <clears throat> range up to 150 nautical miles on a single charge, depending again on what battery pack you choose and uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many. We actually have a, co a table I can give people that shows all the different combinations of batteries and uh, kilowatt hours and, and uh, you know, duration uh, allied to whatever speed you're doing, et cetera, because it's a, a complex kind of uh, thing. Um, as it's said before, dead stick recoverable. Uh, at the moment, it's it's designed for a dive depth of 500 feet, and we don't see this is a literal you know uh, use case, and we don't see you needing to do it, dive beyond 500 feet. It could be done, but again, it gets very complex with the uh, uh, with the ballasting uh, tanks then for for going for going deeper than that. Um, up to 96 hours of emergency air life support and uh, an emergency lift capability capability of 30,000 pounds equal to its own weight. Uh, so it, it gives it another uh, option of being a, uh, a, you know, a salvage and recovery, salvage and recovery uh, vehicle being able to lift some fairly uh, heavy objects up to the surface. Control lift capability of 15,000 pounds. So it's worth worth noting. More of the options, photonics masks, uh, you know, I've mentioned the snorkel recharge, uh, launching of, of various drones, etc. You could put uh, aftermarket, you know, government issued guns, torpedoes, relay systems, uh, seven function uh, robotic manipulator, uh, a pair of uh, seven function robotic manipulators. If, again, if you want to do a lot of engineering work or uh, uh, rescue and recovery type type stuff. But that's, those are just kind of a sample, you know, uh, again, what, if it's within the, the three to six thousand pound payload, then then we can put it on there and we can deal with it, whether it needs a, a pressure vessel or not. So, I, yeah, I saw a quick question about the payload. It's a, a, additional payload is uh, three thousand pounds normally, but we can push that up to six thousand pounds. I'm sure you can come up with a. <laughs> An even longer list than this, but these are some of the uh, interest areas we've had. I talked about the client that's looking at putting uh, mini torpedoes on there, and that's just a, a mock-up of what what that might look like. Um, but anti-terrorism, counter piracy, border security, we're actually a part of two different uh, allied overseas government procurement uh, uh, contracts at the moment, which we're hoping to to close. I've been saying that for about. 12 months now, we're hoping to close very soon. Uh, but like all these uh, government uh, uh, led procurements, they can move and keep moving to the right. But uh, <clears throat> but but part of that would be for a, a border security capability. So um, and uh, drug enforcement, we've even had uh, inquiries about that, being able to go and uh, even uncrewed or crewed to go and um, intercept uh, drug running submarines coming up from South America or from the islands or whatever. So yeah, um, lots of different uh, uh, con ops, as you can imagine. So force projection, you know, uh, one one of the offerings that we've got at the moment with a with a partner is to put it in an offshore uh, patrol vessel, um, so you can then uh, uh, operate out of there. So you can project it on on the larger vessel, and and that could be an LPD LHD type. Uh, craft as well. You can deliver it in into theatre by air onto a, a suitable airstrip or uh, just about airdrop it as well into position. The smallest aircraft that you could fit it on is probably the Air for A400 Atlas, which a lot of the European uh, air forces are using. But the standard kind of C5, C17s would do. You can take it over land uh, on a truck, and that's how we move it, uh, uh, move it around. And um, and of course, um, you know, I, I was having a look at this the other day. Uh, the Black Sea, you could you could dr drop it off anywhere, even in Germany, uh, you know, on 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 the river there, and uh, run it all the way down through um, out through Romania into the Black Sea. So um, you 
not down the Danube River. So, you know, canal systems, multiple ways of getting it uh, uh, to the coast uh, away from uh, away from uh, where it first gets dropped off. All right, Alistair, I'm going to interrupt you here for a second. Yeah. Um, so, so Blair Jenkins, did you have any other questions? Were, were your questions answered okay? You can unmute. This is open. Nope, I'm good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, cool. William, Craig, you want to go ahead and ask your question? We did cover this, but. Yeah, um, well, I, I noticed you have a debt there. Is it certified? Is it class certified for that debt? 500 feet or is that just notional design? Yes, that the whole system is uh, is designed and will be delivered with full class certification. And our uh, head of engineering actually is uh, ex DNV. Oh, well, he's, he was uh, Germanischer Lloyd, uh, which then became he was working for DNVGL, uh, and he was part of the certification team for the dry um, the, the the seal delivery dry submersible as well. Uh, so we've got a lot of that uh, capability on board. But yeah, um, everything to be delivered with full uh, uh, class, and, and whether that be DMVGL, ABS, or or whatever, uh, yeah, certified for that. And and as you say, uh, down to down to five hundred feet. Wow! All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. So so John, I'm going to get this name wrong. Goes goes Brink, goes Brink. You've been unmuted. Do you have a question? Yes, that's a no. Um, no, I don't have a question. All right. Okay. Cool. The, the one, one more thing. Um, I, I, we're we're coming to the end here for for your presentation. I'll give you time to to wrap up. But but Howard Meyer, if you're listening, um, so Alistair, in your previous slide, you showed a picture of this coming out of the back of an aircraft. It was uh, the third one on the top right. Yeah. Do you have a platform for that? No. All right. So no. so Howard. You're listening. I, I see an opportunity for a crater here with the the AARC, um, what what was it called? The uh, the platform that that held the AARC um, jet ski, and possibly being able to modify that to hold something of this size. Yeah, um, and there is interest on uh, given. Uh, uh, base defense, uh, the work and the stuff, interest within the Air Force, and obviously uh, some of the bases being very close to uh, littoral areas, having uh, uh, having some kind of craft uh, that would be uh, viable for use in these uh, these environments may be worthwhile. Um, so th th it'd probably be worth. Uh, uh, not not being familiar with the stuff you're talking about, Eugene, it might be worth uh, uh, engaging and talking some more on this. And uh, I'll see if I can find any people uh, who may be interested in uh, uh, looking at, uh, you know, maybe something like this uh, as potential uh, approach and stuff for addressing these littoral needs. Yeah, because the, the ARC allowed for it to actually deploy to deploy a, a jet ski to the water and and the the uh, the parachute and the container would just fall away from the jet ski leaving the area clear so that it could be operated um you know remotely or autonomously so i, I can yeah. i can definitely see applications here yeah yeah it's you know they're they're, they're like i said they're could potentially be some interest, so it's maybe worth following up. So yeah, we can talk more on this. All right, excellent. Thank you. Thank right, you. So, so Alistair, I'll give you a couple extra minutes because I know I took up a lot of your time. If you can jump through these last few slides, yeah, and, just and I get to your contacts. Yeah. Slide. Okay, and yeah, um, just some of the other areas. Obviously, uh, private ownership, tourism, etc. Or other other use cases for this, not just as a as a defense uh, system. Um, some of the things you were talking about, biofuel, uh, hydrogen. Um, uh, I, I noticed there's some people now got a, a hydrogen capability for UUVs, and so we are very interested. We're going to be talking to them soon. Um, and we've obviously got uh, some designs for uh, uh, for training and, and, and you know, uh, being able to do simulations, et cetera. 
Um, we are looking for uh, round A and round B investment while we while we wait for our first sales to come through. So that's uh, uh, always of interest. And lastly, just for a little bit of to, to put a smile on your face, uh, any of you who've ever read any Clive Cussler uh, and know of Dirk Pitt and his adventures, I'm sure you're thinking this is the the kind of uh, vessel that uh, Dirk Pitt would go around in. Well, it's too late. He's already got one. And uh, this was a book written by Clive Cussler and his son a few years ago that featured the, the fast boat uh, submarine uh, on there. So uh, we're, we're very proud of we're very proud of that. Um, and while I wrap up, I'll just uh, run this uh, video uh, and take any follow up questions you might have um, and just let you see that it it does really exist. Um, and there it is being road transported. Yeah, any more questions that Eugene, that folks have got while we uh, we just watch the video? If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute and chime in. Hey, this is Mike Robinson from NSWC Philadelphia. Um, how long does it take to manufacture one of these and how many of these would you be able to make in a year? Um, yeah, good question. So the first the first ones we build will probably take about 18 months, but thereafter, it'll probably be around about a four month, 16 week turnaround because it's been designed uh, to be built as a kit of parts. And we are not a manufacturer. We would order in a lot of the, a lot of these parts are made by other people, the, you know, obviously the the engines and the, and the hull and the like. And so, um, you know, we could see ourselves building, you know, 50 or more of these a year. It would just depend on the order and, and how much uh, extra, um, uh, area we we needed to to put these together uh, but it doesn't take a huge amount of space it's not a huge factory re required for this so so yeah we could we could build you know tens of these uh, uh, per year uh, in in about a, a 16 week uh, space once the initial um, system builds are finished as I say there's because there's a lot of uh, drawings and we, we, we're completely bootstrapped at the moment and so there's a lot of uh, free work to be to be done a lot of the classification stuff just to be uh, finished off although the uh, overview has been done and and uh, boxes have been ticked on that so um so yeah that's that would be my answer to that thank you thank you and i think at the very last slide just uh, gives the contacts uh, uh, for the company should you you wish to uh, wish to know any more oh, ed ed hendricks um i see you're on can you put uh, whoever is in charge of ARM now in touch? Could you pass this on to them and get them in touch with me, please? And so just just to say, we have, we have talked and shown this to, you know, some of the folks at PEO Maritime, uh, SOCOM. Uh, we've uh, briefed Naval X and, and BMNT. Um, we've done some stuff with MSU Miltech at the moment, talking to the Warfighting Lab for the for the Marine Corps. So there's some stuff going going on. We've been talking to a lot of the uh, Lidoses and, and and the like of the world about uh, uh, you know plug plug and play um, full autonomy packages because that's not within our, our kind of wheelhouse. We would uh, you know subcontract that, uh, but there's a number of uh, different companies that we've talked to who could. Uh, provide both the surface and the subsea uh, autonomy piece uh, for it. All right, so I have two in the chat. Paulo, did you ask your question? And then Tom Painter. Okay, Paulo is asking, have you submitted for DIU's replicator program, Defense Innovation Unit? Uh, I'll need to double check on that, but uh, replicator, okay. Yeah, I can help you with that too. I, I'm, I've been working with uh, with DIU on some other stuff. Okay, and then Tom Painter. Yeah, I just had a quick question. How many people in your company? It's it's well, we're we're bootstrapped, so we we, we all do different things on the side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's about ten of us in total at okay. the moment. I, of course, as soon as soon as we get the first sale, then uh, then we've got a you know a construction team to put together and uh, additional engineering folks to bring on board. But we've got uh, we've got all the key people. Uh, sitting in the wings, waiting to go, including additional uh, engineering uh, resources and yeah. design design resources. So, so yeah, about about ten people um, yeah. in the company. It's always a challenge trying to scale up. Yeah, when you're developing a product. <laughs> yeah. 
And that, that was part of the design phase was we don't want to be, uh, you know, CNC machining stuff too much and 3D right. printing stuff. We, we, we want to be able to get commercial off the shelf stuff wherever possible. Like the whole design that you're looking at is, is actually on multiple vessels that are used for uh, fishing and inshore patrol stuff. Um, right. It's just it's just a matter of uh, putting putting the kit together, you know. So, All right, so what, one last uh, question here in the chat. Um, so Brian Crowley is asking about the hull design and being able to use as a floating hydrokinetic energy flow harvester. Wow. <laughs> for, for both sea and river use. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I, I'd, I'd like to find out more about that. But uh, okay. but yeah, it's it, like I said, like I just said, it's it's a, at the moment, the whole design, the two whole designs we've got are ready, readily available from a vessel manufacturer. As a, as a, an already to go design, they're already used in V form anyway in 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 vessels that are already out there. Things like the pressure um, cabin that you see, that's built by one of the uh, well-known uh, submersible uh, manufacturing companies on the on the west coast of the USA. Um, so you know that's it's all proven technology that's out there doing the work. We're just bringing a lot of that stuff together on a on a unique platform. All right, so. Um... I'm going to ask Brian Crawley if you can put your contact information in. Um, we are we're seven minutes past. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to be a stickler for time. Uh, yeah. We only have two presentations today, so that was a little more lenient. Um, oh, okay, that, that's what I thought it was, Brian. So, yeah, this is uh, so Brian's from a company that's going to be presenting uh, next week. Okay. Uh, about uh, and and you'd be interested in this, Alistair. Yeah, I, I will jump on that to find out what what on earth he was asking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, but also they're 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 doing basalt um, fibers, which is a really fascinating topic. Excellent. All right, so thank you, thank everybody. Uh, love the interaction. Yeah. If you have questions, uh, Alistair's information is here. Uh, this video is posted on our YouTube channel. It's also in the document repository. Uh, on the uh, that's accessible through the website and feel free to reach out to to us to Alistair if you have any further questions require any additional information and check out the videos uh, they're usually up on Friday so thank you thank, thank you, you Alistair great to have you on here again thank you and, and uh, apologies Tom for uh, eating into your time I know no you're in a rush no worries <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> thank you